Now we're ready to elucidate the structure of lactose, answering those three questions that were mentioned in the previous webcast, beginning with the question of which sugar is connected via its anomeric carbon to the other monosaccharide. The way that we're going to answer this is with a two-step reaction sequence. The first step is a mild oxidation. It will react only with hemiacetals, and so if you would just identify these two anomeric carbons, one is an acetal, meaning that it doesn't, it's an anomeric carbon that doesn't have a hydroxyl group, so it has two carbon oxygen bonds, none of which are hydroxyls. The hemiacetal has two carbon oxygen bonds, but one of them is a hydroxyl group. And it's that position which, under the conditions of mild oxidation, back on page 298 we discuss this reaction, will form the aldonic acid. The second step is a hydrolysis step. That's where we're going to break apart that acetal or glycosidic linkage into the, and split that disaccharide into its two monosaccharides, one of which will be oxidized to the aldonic acid. And we can see by looking at the result that it's, it was glucose that was oxidized at its hemiacetal position. We know it's glucose, and you should highlight this bond, because that C4 hydroxyl group is in the equatorial position. And remember, we're dealing with C4 epimers. And so it's galactose, which has the axial hydroxyl group. And that must have been, since we see it's just the mono, it's the monosaccharide unreacted, must have been the sugar on the left, whereas the oxidized carboxylic acid must have come from the sugar on the right that had its acetal functional group. And so now what we know is that the sugar on the left has that C4 axial hydroxyl group. The sugar on the right has the equatorial carbon-oxygen bond. And what we don't know is which of these remaining positions is the linkage between the gl uh, glucose on the right and galactose on the left. And the way that we're going to determine that question is by with a reaction that's known as exhaustive methylation. So again, a two-step sequence. First, where we're going to put a methyl ether at each hydroxyl group. This is a reaction that's an SN2 reaction. Under basic conditions, we can deprotonate those hydroxyl groups, making a good nucleophile. SN2 reaction on this reagent, that's known as dimethyl sulfate. Dimethyl sulfate is a good methylating agent. And we will then subject that in the second step to a hydrolysis, breaking apart the methylated disaccharide into two monosaccharides, which will have methyl groups everywhere except for that hydroxyl group that, that except for the oxygen atom that was linked as its acetal and was not a hydroxyl group. So what we find when we subject the disaccharide lactose to exhaustive methylation followed by hydrolysis, we get, as we would expect, methylation on each of the hydroxyl groups on the sugar on the left, which is, which is galactose, except, of course, for the position at C1. That's the position that was involved in that glycosidic bond formation. So it was stable to the exhaustive methylation conditions. And the key piece of information, that's not surprising, the key piece of information comes from the where the methylation takes place on the sugar on the right, glucose. In glucose, we see that it's 2,3,6-trimethylglucose. And that must have meant that methylation took place there, and there, and there. Methylation would also take place there, but that would form a methyl acetal. And so under the conditions of hydrolysis, that reverts back to the hydroxyl group. The key point, though, and you can see the position that did not get highlighted because it didn't form a methyl group, it must have been this oxygen, which is connected to the C1 position of galactose. And so what we can conclude is the complete structure is galactose on the left with its axial hydroxyl group connected at C4 to glucose on the right. And so what we would describe this as is galactose linked at position one, anomeric position, to position four,
of glucose through that glycosidic linkage. And what we don't know is the stereochemistry. Is that alpha or is it beta? And the way that we'll determine this is by subjecting that disaccharide to a glycosidase that's specific to the stereochemistry at the C1 position. Beta glycosidase will only hydrolyze beta glycoside bonds, whereas alpha glycosidase will only hydrolyze alpha glycoside bonds. There's another way to determine this, and it's often used. It's NMR and coupling constants. If you can see that these hydrogen atoms labeled H1 and H2 have much different orientations in the two different anomers, alpha or beta. And so that difference, whether there is, and you can see just by looking down this bond, the Newman projections that are formed. So if you want in your notes to go ahead and draw, the I is positioned here, and we're looking down this bond. The I is positioned here. We're looking down this bond. And in that way, we come up with these two different Newman projections that show an axial equatorial arrangement of hydrogen atoms or a diaxial arrangement of hydrogen atoms. Those coupling constants are very different in the case of the diaxial hydrogen atoms, 8 to 10 hertz, easily identified relative to the 2 to 3 coupling hertz coupling constant for an axial equatorial hydrogen. So we could either use NMR or we could use glycosidase. Here we'll use glycosidase when we subject lactose to lactase, which is a beta glycosidase, we end up with a pair of monosaccharides. When we subject lactose to an alpha gl uh, glycosidase or glycosidase, we end up with no reaction. So what we can conclude, since it's a beta glycosidase, which performs the uh, uh, the cleavage of that disaccharide, we can conclude that lactose is beta linked. In other words, there's an equatorial carbon oxygen bond at the C1 position of galactose. We conclude then the complete structure is drawn or, or represented by this notation here. Galactose on the left, beta linked at its anomeric position C1 to the carbon hydroxyl group at carbon 4 of glucose.